John chapter 11, let's begin in verse 45. Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did believed in him. But some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things Jesus did. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, What shall we do? For this man works many signs. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and nation. And one of them, Caiaphas, high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not the whole nation should perish. Now that he is... Not, um, now this he did not say on his own authority, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not only for the nation only, and not for the na- for that nation only, but also that he would gather together in one in in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. Then from that day on they plotted to put him to death. Therefore Jesus no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there into the country near the wilderness to a city called Ephraim. And there remained with his disciples. And the Passover of the Jews was near, and many went from the, from the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Then they sought Jesus and spoke among themselves as they stood in the temple, What do you think, that he will not come to the feast? Now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a command that if anyone knew where he was, he should report it, that they might seize him. Chapter 12, verse 1. Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was, um, was, who had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of, of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. Then one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why has this fragrant oil not, not sold uh, for, three, for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Then he said, not that he cared, um, this he said rather, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box and he used to take what was put in it. But Jesus said, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you have with you always, but me you do not have always. Now a great many of the Jews knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests plotted to put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him, many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. Let's pray together. Lord, as always when we come before you, before your word, Lord, we are humbled and we recognize that it is so much more than we would ever need it to be, but we th- we're thankful that it is all that we need it to be. So we yield our lives to you now, our, our hearts. We want to be changed. Lord, we thank you that your words are spirit and they are truth. Lord, help us to be doers of the word, not hearers only. So we commit it to you. We pray that you'd set this time aside for your holy use in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Well, we are getting closer and closer to the end of Jesus' public ministry. John's been focusing on the seven signs uh, that he uh, laid out. We saw the last one last week, raising Lazarus from the dead. And we also saw the fifth of the seven I am statements where Jesus claims uh, divinity when he said, I am the resurrection and the life. So today, as we're looking at these verses, we arrive at about a week from his crucifixion, specifically the day before his triumphant entry. And from this point on, Jesus is going to focus on on Jesus, um, or John's going to focus rather, on Jesus getting his disciples ready for his departure. Then the crucifixion will come, then the resurrection will come, and he's still going to be ministering to his disciples even subsequent to his resurrection. So all of this has happened around 40 to 50 years after the, the, the events occurred. John is an old man now. He's in his 80s or 90s here, and and he's sharing all these things. They've had Matthew, Mark, and Luke all this time, so he he fills in a lot of things that they didn't have, and he focuses on this last week, and even much of the rest of the book of John is just the last 24 hours before his crucifixion. 
And so I want to begin in verse 45, just for context, as we looked at that last week. Verse 45 says, Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did believed in him. Back in verse 31, a group of friends of Mary had been comforting her and followed her to where Jesus was, and then subsequently onward to Jesus' tomb and got to witness the miracle, and they believed. So he's saying there, John is, that... Um, they had seen these things and they believed in him. Verse 46, but some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things Jesus did. Now, we're not told if they were antagonistic, probably were, but they could have just wanted the miracle to you know, be known by the Pharisees. They, some of them may have even wanted to affect the Pharisees in a positive way. We're not told here regarding what their motivation was, but they went and told the leadership and that allows us to see a glimpse into what they were thinking as they were plotting and planning this whole thing regarding arresting Jesus and everything. Notice in verse 47, they gathered a council. Verse 47, then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, what shall we do? For this man works many signs. So they gathered this council. It was called the Sanhedrin. It was a group of 71 men and it was 70 men that were well-esteemed, 70 men that were respected. Some of them had already served previously as priests and leaders and all of that, plus the high priest. So 70 plus one equals 71. I know you're thankful for that, me doing the math for you. But um, these were mostly Pharisees. The majority, or excuse me, the majority were Sadducees. And these were the religious leaders. Most of the priests were, were Sadducees. Um, and, and, and they didn't believe in the rest. Of the, they only believed in the five, first five books of the, of the Bible. They didn't believe in miracles. They didn't believe in the future resurrection. Uh, and, and so the Pharisees were in the minority. Saul of Tarsus, who would later become the Apostle Paul, was likely a member of this group. So they didn't know what to do. They said, you know, this man works many signs. I mean, John only mentioned seven, and, you know, he's focusing on seven as these are the signs that you should know and understand and believe to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. And by believing you may have life in his name. He states the purpose of why he wrote the book. And we've looked at that. But now these religious leaders are past trying to discredit him. They've tried everything to discredit him. And they attacked his person. They've, they've criticized him. They've, they've, they've maligned him. They've gossiped. They've slandered everything against him to try to stop him. And none of it has worked. They've gone through, through saying that he does this by the power of Satan to say that and then, then, he, then they went into these demon possessed. Then they threatened people that if you follow this man or claim that he's the Messiah, you're going to be put out of the synagogue. They've tried everything. And then in verse 48, they state their dilemma. Verse 48, if we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him and the Romans will come and take away our place and nation. So this is... This would be a disaster. Everyone believing in Jesus, we can't have that. We can't have that. That would be, that would be completely uh, uncalled for. So their, their main concern had to, had to do with the Romans. They believed that the Romans would see everyone believing in Jesus as a threat. And so notice the risk, though. The Romans would take away their place and nation. They loved their place. Jesus talked about that. I think in Matthew 19, he go, talks, they love the seat of Moses. They love, the, they love to be recognized in public places. They love to be esteemed. They love to be looked up to. They love that place of authority. Man, that's such a danger in all of our hearts to be looked at and, and, and lifted up high and having all of those things be pointing to ourselves instead of pointing to, to God. So they love their place, and they knew that that was in danger, um, but 40, 40 years later, all of this would happen. In A.D. 70, the, the Roman general Titus took four legions of soldiers, 60,000 soldiers, and he went and conquered that city. And the Jews only had 23,000. They were greatly outnumbered, of course, not just with, with numbers, but with, with, you know, probably... I mean, these Romans were really well trained. And so he overtook and conquered... Uh, this, this city and destroyed the temple and all of that. Jesus prophesied that. He said, talked about not one of these stones will be left on another. And as the disciples were impressed and showing him the temple as if he never saw it before, but they're, they're, you know, like, look at this. And he's like, not one of these stones will be left on another. You can see those stones toppled over and on top of one another today 
in Jerusalem. You can see the leftover stones is that they toppled over with all these thousands of troops pushing and pushing and, and destroying the temple and all that. All that's left is a retaining wall that went around the temple. That's what's called the Western Wall or the Wailing Wall. So he destroyed them. So this would happen. They would lose their place. They would lose their, that, that, their identity as the nation and everything. And then look at verse 49. And one of them, Caiaphas, uh, being high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all. You know nothing at all. Don't you love that? Don't you love when people tell you you know nothing at all? It's really encouraging. Uh, Josephus, the Jewish historian, said that the Sanhedrin and, and, and the, specifically the, the Sadducees, they spoke very disrespectfully to another, to one another. And Jews, you know, in general are very blunt. That's just how they talk. They're just blunt. Uh, and so here he is saying this, and he continues in verse 50, nor do you consider that it, that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not that the whole nation should perish. And he really had no idea what he was really saying. And John comes in and helps us understand what he was really saying, even apart from what he had planned to say. Look with me at verses 51 and 52. Now this he did not say on his own authority, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for that nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. So they believe the high priest was inspired by God, and whoever was serving in that capacity could prophesy. And so Caiaphas, you know, obviously he's not a godly man. He's plotting to kill the Messiah. But um, he's saying he's think, saying one thing, but then God is working and speaking through him in a completely different way. In a different, he doesn't even know, realize he's being a tool of God in that moment, saying the truth about the very man that was going to, that he was plotting against. And we're told in Proverbs chapter 21, verse 1, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Like the rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes. The God is sovereign over even ungodly kings and people that don't know, don't, don't know him. He's sovereign over them and he can determine what they do, what they say and all of that. So he didn't realize that he was prophesying in, in this way and, and God had a totally different intent for it than what he was planning. So he says Jesus would die for the nation, but notice in 52, John adds, he would gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. You may remember when we were in uh, John chapter 10, Jesus was speaking about being the good shepherd and, and he loves his sheep and all of that. And he said in John chapter 10, verse 16, and other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring and they will hear my voice and there will be one flock and one shepherd. So John says that Caiaphas doesn't even know what he's saying. And he's, 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 God's intending it to talk about that there's not just one flock. There's many that he's going to bring together into one flock. And that's us, the Gentiles. A Gentile is a non-Jew. And, and all the Gentiles, we're told in Romans, have been grafted into the vine. That God placed us in, in the vine. And we now are part of this body of Christ. And God intended that all through the Old Testament and everything when you really look at it. Because his, prob his promise, rather, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob when the, and having their descendants be so innumerable is connected to the Gentiles being accepted. And God said it through Isaiah. He said it through many different uh, leaders and prophets there. And that's why they, God led them to, to uh, have a, a court of the Gentiles, which is the most square footage on the Temple Mount complex there, so that they could come and seek God and pray. And, and God wanted to bring all, all of mankind, everyone, into one fold. Now notice that they make this formal decision in verse 53 regarding Jesus. Verse 53, Then from that day on, they plotted to put him to death. Now they'd already, when he, when he had, that's what they kept trying to get him to say exactly who you are. We noted that back when we were in those chapters where he, they were saying, exactly, tell us plainly. They're trying to get him to say it. And he's like, I already told you. But he had said enough at a few different points there where they're like, we don't need to hear anything else. We've heard him claim to be the Messiah, claim to be God in human flesh, and that's enough for us. He's committed um, blasphemy and all that. So they believe he's already guilty, but they're making this shift here of saying formally as a, as a, uh, a, a group or as a, um, you know, a, a council, they're saying we will not stop. This is going to happen. We will continue 
to focus on this and arrest him and bring him and, 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 and take him to the authorities. They had no right to, to commit capital punishment except in one case. And so sometimes they would get so you know, out of their minds with anger that they would, they would try to stone somebody uh, and, and not even care about that rule. But they weren't supposed to try to engage in that at all. So they plotted, they, they said from now on, they were going to plot to put him to death. Verse 54, therefore Jesus no longer walked openly among the Jews. He went from there into the country near the wilderness to a city called Ephraim and there remained with his disciples. So he recognizes my time has not yet come. It's not the time for me to be arrested. Remember the, 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 the time for him to be revealed as the Messiah is the next day. At, at the triumphant entry, when he comes to the day. The prophecy that's in Daniel chapter 9, 26 and 27, prophesied the exact day that the Messiah would come and present himself as, as the Messiah. And that's what happened on Palm Sunday. To the day. You can't be off at all, one way or the other. It's exactly, if you do the calculations and all of that, it's exactly to the day. That's enough evidence for any skeptic to, if they're honest with themselves, to admit that this is, this is scriptural, this is inspired by God, and if he's not the Messiah, nobody's the Messiah. And, and him being the Messiah answers all these questions because what the Messiah is revealed in Isaiah 9-6 as God in human flesh, the mighty God. And if God doesn't lie, God can't lie. So whatever he says is true. Jesus said that if anyone comes to me, I'll give you rest. And he was inviting people to come to him because we can't, we can, the rest is connected to being right with God. God's holy and we're sinful. Even after we become Christians, I don't know if you noticed, you're a sinner. You know, you still sin. We still fall short of that standard. The standard is perfection. As I've said many times, when they used to shoot arrows, uh, they used to say when they missed the bullseye, I have sinned in England. I have sinned. Because you're missing the mark. You're missing the bullseye. We fall short of perfection all the time. All of us do. So that's why... We, we can never, ever be righteous enough or religious enough to earn a right standing with God. But God didn't leave us in that condition. He sent Jesus. He knew all that from eternity past. He sent Jesus to take our place because he was innocent. He never did sin. That's why he had to have the virgin birth. And so he, he grew up perfect. He, he never did the wrong thing. He always did the right thing so that he can die in our place, so that we can trust in him, and then he can give us his righteousness as a gift, nothing that we could earn. We can never be good enough to, out, to outweigh our sin. Even in our, in, our, in our systems today, people have to pay for each sin. There's diff, multiple counts even of the same behavior. They have to pay for each, uh, you know, each time that you committed the crime. And you can't come into a judge and say, you know, I did community service, I did all these things to make up for, for that. They would say, sorry, you gotta pay for this. So Jesus died in our place so that we could receive salvation as a gift. As I've said many times, all the different religions are man's attempt to reach God through works. Christianity is God's attempt to reach man through the cross and offer salvation as a gift. That's a huge, huge difference. The Bible's the only thing that's, that's honest about man, that we're sinners. It's the only thing that tells the truth about man, that we're sinners and we could never be good enough. It's not a view of like we're the worst things in the world ever and we're horrible. and we No, we're made in, God, in God's image. He said that. But we can't save ourselves and the whole sacrificial system for the Jews all pointed to Jesus fulfilling those sacrifices by dying on the cross and then being buried and then raising from the dead. So that's the hope that we have. And, and so here they are just going against all of this and saying we have to put this man to death. And so, he, and so he went into this wilderness here in verse 54 to, to, to not, you know, get ahead of things because there's a timing, exactly a timing for his death. And that wasn't going to be missed. We've seen it over and over again in, in the Gospel of John that he said, my time has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. They would try to seize him and they couldn't seize him. There was the exact timing for all of that. So he's going to go away for a little bit, but then he's, he's also starting to deal with his disciples. He's also starting to prepare them for him leaving. It's going to be really difficult. The whole time he's trying to tell them off and on different times, you know, I'm going to be betrayed into the hands of sinful men. I'm going to be, you know, he's telling them about his death and they're just, 
They can't hear it. They can't accept it. They can't, they're thinking that he's going to be a political Messiah. They think that he's going to take them out from under the bondage of Rome. But that's not why he came. He came to forgive mankind of our sins. Verse 55, And the Passover of the Jews was near, and many went from the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. So this is a Jewish ritual purification that they're engaged in, and they would, it would take up to seven days, uh, and they would offer sacrifices, they would do different washings in the little um, washing uh, tubs or whatever they're called, they're called mikvahs, and there's some that are bigger than others. They've, they've recently found in recent years over 40 mikvahs at the base of the southern steps in Jerusalem, and they've recently found the Pool of Siloam and that's about the size of two Olympic pools. They recently found that. And a pathway that leads from there all the way up to where the Wailing Wall is. And they would go up onto the temp into the temple complex there. They recently found that. So archaeology is always confirming what Scripture says. Or, or as people say, the Scripture confirms archaeology. Um, and, and so there's this, this, this whole ritual that they were engaged in. And so they were already starting to do that, prepare for the Passover. Verse 56, Then they sought Jesus and spoke among themselves as they stood in the temple. What do you think? That he will come? That he will not come to the feast? Oh, he'll be there. He's coming. Uh, it's going to happen. And, and, now, and now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a command that if anyone knew where he was, he should report it, that they should seize him. So again, this, this is an overflow of their decision when they met that this has to happen. This is going to happen. We are going to arrest him. We are going to um, you know, try to have him be killed. Again, through the Roman authorities, they, they need to do it that way. Now we hit chapter 12. This is a whole different scene now. Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. So again, we're a day before the triumphant entry. This is the last Sabbath Jesus is going to enjoy. You know, the next following Saturday, he'll be in the tomb. So this is how close we are. Now, we have, we're only in chapter 12. We have the whole rest of the book of John to cover that time period. And so John really focused on that, just the last portion of his public ministry. At this point, he had just eaten at Zacchaeus' home the night before. Uh, and, and so he's coming in there, and he's, it's, it's, he's coming from Jericho area. He's, instead of going into Jerusalem, he goes up to Bethany, which is on the other side of the Temple Mount or not Temple Mount, the Mount of Olives. And so he's making his way up there. There's at least 17 people in the house. I don't know how big the house was, but typically they weren't that big. There's 17 people in the house because there's the 12 disciples. This is at the house of Simon the leper, we're told in other gospels. So there's Simon the leper at least, and then the 12 disciples, then Jesus, and then um, you know Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. And, and so there's this group here. They're in this, they're, they want to enjoy this supper together. We're told in verse 2, there they made him a supper and Martha served. Well, surprise, surprise, surprise. A little Gomer pile there. Um, that Martha is serving. Of course she's serving. That's what she's about is serving and doing. She was very much into doing practical things, it, is, it seems. But then we're told that Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Amazing. Sitting there with Jesus. And you can imagine what's going on in his heart. I, mean, I have no idea if he's still upset that he's back, you know, being already gone to the other side and then he's brought back. I mean, you could make a strong case that it'd be very disappointing to come back here. But he's with Jesus at the table. And at those tables, they reclined. They didn't normally sit in chairs, so they would recline back like on one arm. And that's in part how John was able to lay his head on Jesus' breast but it's also in this account is going to make it easier for, I mean, I believe Mary would do it anyway, but make it easier for Mary to pour this on, on, on his feet, on this oil. And it's just a beautiful expression of, of, of worship. So it's unprecedented. Look at verse three. Then Mary took a pound, and it's really three-fourths of a pound, of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, or no, the feet of Jesus, and wiped her feet with her with her hair. Wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. Notice the verse three. It says very costly uh, oil of spikenard. 
and, and, and it was very, very, very expensive. I mean, they're, the disciples are in shock that she would do this, and then they're in complete shock there. Spikenard was from an Indian plant, um, and it was red, and, and it was very, very costly. It was hard to get, um, and we're told that she anointed Jesus' feet. The other Gospels don't mention her name, by the way, uh, in Matthew and Mark, probably because of persecution. And John's, you know, really old now. All these people have, are gone. So it, there's no threat in saying, you know, her name or whatever. But, you know, he's, he's including this. And she's pour, and also it includes pouring it on his head in the other Gospels. So he poured it on her, his head, but also his feet. So it was red. Can you imagine sitting there and seeing, you know, Jesus head just wet, covered with this red oil, and then his feet were covered and all of that, just dripping down, and she wiped his feet with her hair. This was, this was, this may not seem obvious on the surface, but in that culture, women just didn't put their hair down in public. That was for just being in their home with their husband and all of that. For her to let her hair down and do this, she was completely letting everything go. She was, it was really, really bold of Mary. She didn't care what anyone thought and it's a trait of pure worship, by the way. Not caring what people think, regardless if you're doing it in song or giving or, or serving or all the different ways that God gives us to, to express worship to him. It, uh, you know, but when you're getting to the point where you don't care at all and you're not focused on yourself at all and you're completely focused on him, that's the kind of worship that he is worthy of, for one. But number, number two, it's like there's something that's happened between her and, and him, for this to happen in the sense of her sitting at his feet and listening and being transformed by his words and taking all those things in and, and, and appropriating all those things. She is so far ahead of where the disciples are at at this point regarding what worship means. So John says the house was filled with the fragrance. I bet John at this point, 40, 50 years later, can still smell it. You know, smell is connected to memory as we talked about recently. And, and just can still smell what that which filled the whole entire house. The effect of her worship filled the whole house. And, and it's, what a beautiful example of, of, of worship. And so um, he continues, verse 4, Then one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? One denarii was a day's wage for the average working man. So 300 denarii would be basically a year's, when you subtract out all their feasts and all their holidays and all that, that would be like a, a, a year's wages. And they're, they're indignant uh, and all of that. So this, effect, this, this, this uh, objection, though, affected the rest of the disciples. And the other Gospels where it mentions this account, it, talk, it says the disciples were upset. So it started out with Judas. John gives us this detail that the others don't, that it started with Judas and then spread to the other disciples. But John gives us the real reason for this in verse 6. This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box, and he used to take what was put in it. So he just helped himself. Now, why would God allow, why would Jesus allow Judas, knowing who he was, to, to, to oversee the money? I don't know. I mean, he's sovereign over all of it, it's not like he's limited. It's not like he, you know, he's telling Peter to go check out that fish. You know, there's a fish with a coin in it. I mean, he's not, he's not needing money. He can do whatever he wants. I mean, he multiplied loaves and fishes. There's no, there's no problem for him. But it's, it's a mystery why he let him do that. And, and you know, it's, you can wonder. You can, you know, have theories. Maybe, you, you know, we can ask the Lord when we get there. Um, but then I love here the, the verse 7 that Jesus defends her. Verse 7. But Jesus said, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. I love that. I love that this expression that he says about her and her love and what the purpose of it was for and everything. It really touched him. You can see that it really, really touched him. Then he adds to it in verse 8. For the poor you have with you always, but me you do not have always. Now, the Lord Jesus is not saying we shouldn't give to the poor. He's just saying, take advantage of this time now to do what's appropriate for me. And that's what she's doing. And you'll have the poor to, to minister to. 
you know, you'll never have an end to that because there'll always be the poor. So he's not against, you know, giving to the poor. Some people have accused him of that, which is crazy. Now, Matthew adds that he said this about what she did. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. And look at today, 2000, almost 2,000 years later, we're talking about it. We're seeing her love for, for Jesus. We're seeing this thing that he did and how it was mentioned um, in God's word. Now, verse 9, we're told, Now a great many of the Jews knew that he was there, and they came, not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. But the chief priest plotted to put Lazarus to death also. <laughs> Can you believe that? We're not going to let this guy live. He died once. We're not, and he was res- it's not his fault he was resurrected. <laughs> what are you taking out on him for? But he was an object of faith. He was something that people could point to and say, that is an evidence that Jesus is the Messiah. Well, they didn't want any evidence that Jesus was the Messiah. So to take, put, taking him out was their solution. I wonder if Lazarus knew that, that they're plotting to take his life too. You brought me back. I'm in this world again, you know, that's cursed. And now I have to deal with now, you know, worrying about someone murdering me or whatever. So um, maybe he was happy about that so he could go back to where he was. Verse 11, because on account of him, many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. So there's, 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 uh, there's lessons in here regarding worship, I think, that I really want to deal with briefly before I close. And that is, there's, we can't explain what happens in a person that's affected by what Jesus has done in our lives. We can't explain that always. You know, this was unprecedented. This woman never saw anybody do something like this. I don't know how, why she had this, this flask or this, uh, this jar or whatever it was. You know, th- this is something that was between her and the Lord. But she could have had it as a family heirloom. I don't know if they were wealthy. I have no idea. But the point is, is that it, to her, it was worth sacrificing to bless her Lord that had poured into her, that had given her so much instruction, that it changed her life. She wanted to, to, to worship him in this way. And the way people worship won't always make sense to us. We, it, it may not seem conventional. It may not seem that it's normal. But there's something that's happening between them and the Lord that is very special. We can't get in the way of that. There's people that do all kinds of different things as a result of their relationship with him that don't make sense. They serve in certain ways. They, they give in certain ways. They, they, they want their lives to represent worship like all of us do because we've been affected so much. You know, I've been a Christian for 33 years. And I was a 20-year-old and my life was transformed. I wasn't looking for it to be transformed. I just showed I was chasing a girl. You guys know the story. I was chasing a girl. And through that, my, you know, there's lots of seeds that have been planted in my life through my sisters that have been praying for me for 10 years. But I finally surrendered. I finally quit running from God and realized I, my life was not what God intended. And I couldn't get my sins forgiven apart from the salvation that he'd provide, provided for me. And I have to humble myself. You have to come to him as a little child and humble yourself before him and ask for forgiveness. Don't be afraid of what he's going to turn you into. He's going to make you more like Christ. And to look like Christ and to be like Christ is a great thing. Who doesn't want that? So we, we, we think about that and we think about how Jesus changes a person. And he affects a person so much that they have a heart to worship. And he really doesn't look at... When we're talking about worship and all the different ways that he gives us to worship, it's not so much about what something's worth that we offer to him, it's what we give up. What we, what we give up to be able to give that uh, to him. What it costs us. You know, sometimes people give and it doesn't cost them anything. And then God wants us to give in, in a way, and I'm not talking about money necessarily, but wants to give in a way that is costly, that we sacrifice to do it. That's when it means something, you know, in that way. So when you think of, like, Jesus noticed the widow that gave the two little mites. I have some mites that I got in Israel. They're very small. They're very insignificant. Widows in that day were very much needy, and she gave all that she had. And Jesus noticed it wasn't a percentage. It was what it cost her. It cost her everything to do that. There are people that give millions of dollars. It's not a sacrifice. That doesn't matter. It, it, it doesn't affect them whatsoever. But 
there's scripture, scriptural principles of giving sacrificially and cheerfully and in faith and with joy and with love and all those things. That's what he's looking at. He's looking at our hearts when we give our time, when we give our gifts, when we give whatever that he leads us to give. And so we can miss that. And so I think the disciples had to learn a lesson there. They were completely disconnected from what God had been doing in Mary's heart. What God had been doing in Mary's heart is, is producing a worshiper, producing someone that knew that he was worthy of everything that she had to offer. And instead of that, they were all affected by this man who was stealing from the money box, and they were complaining and griping about this, this thing that could be used other ways. God, you know, God can use our worship in many different ways. So we can't, pre, we can't judge somebody and say, you are doing it the wrong way. But if someone has a heart to do it and someone really wants to touch the heart of Jesus by doing what they're doing, who are we to stand in the way? We just have to let them do what they're going to do. And I've watched it for decades. People worship and, and express love for him in so many different ways, ways that I would never feel comfortable doing that in that way, but they do, and I have to respect that. So I think it's a good lesson for us, and just to see her worship, just to see the effect of what he has done in her life, her taking the most, okay, what's the most expensive thing that I have? What's the thing that's gonna cost me the most to show him that I love him? Oh, it's that oil. I mean, I don't know if they Mary and, and Martha shared that oil, and Martha's going, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, well, I, I can't even imagine what, what, what these other people are thinking, but it was between her and the Lord. And it was the right decision. And, and so that's a good lesson for us regarding other people's worship. We can't get into all that. That's between them and the Lord. But it's a beautiful thing. You know, Jesus reveals that he sacrificed so much to us, for us. And we, our lives have been changed. John later says in his epistle, we love him because he first loved us. So our whole life is called to be a response to what he's done for us. And he loves it. He sees it all and it blesses him. That's the beautiful thing. Our worship hits the target every single time because he sees it and he loves it. Let's pray together. Thank you, Father, for this account. We do remember Mary. We do remember what she did for you. It is a memorial. And we're, we're thankful for that you included it in the record for us to learn from. We pray, Lord, that we would desire you above anything else, Lord, and, and help us to just completely surrender what costs a lot to us, to you, Lord, because everything belongs to you already. And so we want, we want to be yielded to you. We want to be a blessing to your heart, Lord. Make us, into, make us into the worshipers you've called us to be, Lord. And we surrender to you. We thank you that you've changed our lives. We thank you that you've allowed our lives to cross over from death to life, and now we're spiritually alive. Lord, help us to be um, paramedics in this world, helping people, loving people, serving people, being humble, Lord, and being an extension of you in this world. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.